I made a comment about my squash, four different varieties, no insecticides, no poisons, no sprays, and I don't have insects in my squash. So I'm going to try to attempt to explain and show you what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and why it works. It's in the middle of the afternoon. It's terribly hot here. I have had no rain for several weeks. I do not irrigate. What you see here are my transplanted acorn squash and they are showing stress from lack of water and the excess heat. By six o'clock this evening they will be perked right back up. The good thing is you can look in here and see what's going on underneath. You can see all the squash that are set. And you can also see that there's not any bugs in here running around. There's no chewing happening. And there's some pretty nice... If I can find it. There's some pretty nice little squash set on. There's another plant over here with several squash. Now here we're into butternut or acorn squash that was direct seeded. It's doing a little bit better moisture wise but it's also in a little better section of soil. Now these are Delicata and they have squash set on them. There's a nice one down there. And these again are the transplanted ones. And over here I think we're getting into the ones that were direct seeded. And you'll see that these couple right here are looking pretty good, and then over here we've got some that are pretty puny. But even on the puny ones, I don't have insect damage, nothing that's hurting anything. The difference between that bunch and these over here is there's a change in the soil. Now this is a row of spaghetti squash. And I see one that's sizing up pretty good. But as I'm going to walk you down the row here because the soil changes as I go. That is the poor end of the bed. It gets a little better here, but you see the residue I have here? That is bindweed. And this was infested with bindweed to the point where some of the squash, like right there, were very much overcome by the bindweed. But again, and you can see a little bindweed still in there. I came in and hand pulled it. And I have the ground cover fabric to help control it. But when we get out of the area where the bindweed was, look at the difference in the squash. No bindweed. The squash is doing great. Then I ran into a place where, whoops, something happened. That one's not happy. But the one next to it is, and the one over here is. And a little further down the road, there's another one that's not happy. Well, I can tell you that when I bought this place, I think we can see it here. There is a corner post up there, 
and from that corner post all the way down into the neighbor's field over there this used to be one farm and there was a fence in here and when I have made my terraces I came through that old fence line and I noticed that it didn't make a difference what I planted when I got to that fence line something was wrong and this is part of what I'm seeing a neighbor told me that he used to work for these folks that farmed this and he says I can tell you what's going on he said the guy that owned the place worked for the power company and he came in here and sprayed the fence row with something the power company was using and absolutely killed everything for 10 years. So I have a little bit of carryover here from something. But then it picks up again and they look pretty decent. Now right next to the squash is earth tones dent corn and you can see again the difference in the soil there's a little space right in there where the corn is shorter not quite as vigorous and then over here it gets very vigorous and just keeps on going now there's been no cultivation. I have not weeded anything. And I'm using the ground cover fabric mainly as weed control and moisture control. These are some of my direct seeded butternut. This is Metro, the variety from Johnny's. I did not get a perfect stand, but it's good enough. And in a couple of weeks, you won't be able to see anything but squash plants. Now let's talk about some basics. Let's start with the soil. I see a lot of you folks show pictures of your farm, your garden, your whatever you're growing. And I see this gorgeous black loamy soil or sandy loam. But I don't have that. This farm was a worn out tobacco farm and over pastured and over grazed piece of land. When I bought it and I started a little garden back behind me here for my own personal use. I planted rye as a cover crop for fall and winter. That rye did not get any taller than 8 to 10, 12 inches. That was it. That's how poor this land was. I ran a soil test and there wasn't enough phosphorus in this soil to grow any good crop. When I looked at the rest of the nutrients, there was almost no zinc, very, very little copper, not enough boron to do any good. Uh, calcium and magnesium was low, some of it out of balance. So what I did is I started with some of the basics, and the most basic was the phosphorus issue. And I applied phosphorus in a non-organic form. And this may turn some of you off, but I've used diammonium phosphate. And I had some reasons for doing it. First of all, let's back up a second. I was born and raised on an organic dairy farm in the 50s in southwestern Indiana. I followed the organic magazine, everything that Rodale published, I bought it and read it, 
all the way up until the early 70s. One of the things I had noticed was that in 1950, when someone would write to Rodale in the magazine and ask them what was wrong with their, their garden, what kind of a problem they were having, the answer back then was basically check your pH and add more compost. In 1970, that was still the standard answer. Now, fast forward today and look at the groups we have here and you farmers, and if compost and check your pH was the answer, there's a lot of you that shouldn't have any problems. So let's enter the next step of the phase, and that was I got introduced to the Albrecht system. I read everything I could find on the Albrecht system. It made a lot of sense to me. And then I started watching the consultants that were using it. And Don Schrafer was one of them. He died of cancer a few years ago. Probably got that because he was consulting with large farmers who were spraying everything. But after Don, then Neil Kenzie showed up. And Neil Kenzie is at the top of the Albrecht system in the world. In fact, in July there is a conference being held in Missouri that is hosting people from all over this country and all over the world. There's people from Australia and from the uh, European Union area, Canada, and these are all farmers or consultants that have accepted the Albrecht system and applied it in all kinds of situations. Now, back to the phosphorus issue and why I chose DAP. Under the organic standards, I had two choices. I could use compost or I could use cattle manure. Well, right here in my area, I don't have one single neighbor that has manure that I would trust. So that was an option I wasn't willing to take. And the other one was they have compost available, and one of the most readily available is mushroom compost. And I tried a load of that, or I tried a, not a load, I tried some that I got in a pickup on a home garden when I first moved down here to Tennessee, and it was the worst thing I ever did. I don't trust that. So then let's look at rock phosphate, or soft rock phosphate. Soft rock phosphate is calcium and phosphorus, and it's a good product, but it's about half calcium and half phosphorus. Now let's go back to my pH and my balance between calcium and magnesium. If I used rock phosphate, it would screw up my balance of calcium and magnesium, and I would have to do something like buy a whole bunch of Epsom salts to bring the magnesium back up. That doesn't make sense. So what I did is I used the diammonium phosphate as a fertilizer for my cover crop. And I grew a cover crop in the summertime, I grew a cover crop in the winter. And two years later, I had a phosphorus level that was acceptable to me, and now I don't have to use the diammonium phosphate every time I turn around. I monitor it, and when it starts going low, uh, the phosphorus, and I'll bring it back up again. Then I looked at trace elements. Uh, I was terribly low in copper, terribly low in zinc, and so I added those two. My manganese is acceptable. Uh, my iron was okay. Uh, the 
boron is low. It's almost low in everywhere you go. But that's an easy fix. All you have to do is add a little bit of 20 meal team boron, borax, laundry stuff, add a little bit of it to some irrigation water. And do that once or twice through the season. It doesn't take much. And that will eliminate the boron deficiency for the plant that growing season. Now with copper and zinc, let's use copper as an example. There is a mentality in this country that we isolate everything and we find out what the minimum amount is that we can get by with. And then it becomes a standard. So when you look at copper recommendations, oh my God, when you get above two parts per million, you've got excess copper. Now what Kinsey has done is he has taken Albrecht's research and recommendations and over the past 45 years built on his observations and adjusted copper and zinc and all the rest of things at different levels to find out what the optimum is. And Neil is now telling us that when everything else is lined up, specifically the calcium and magnesium, when you have that into place, you can raise your copper level to 15 parts per million. And it provides all kinds of other benefits that most people don't want to accept. Well, mine's not at 15 yet, but it's way above five or six or seven. I haven't done a test this year to see where I'm sitting, but I should be in some of these terraces. I should be about 10. Zinc. Zinc was low here. I took my zinc up somewhere between 15 and 20 parts per million. And what there's there's a correlation between copper and zinc and all the other nutrients. There's a correlation with how the plant uses that and how the human body uses it or any other animal. Copper and zinc are utilized by the, the human body in the immune system. So why wouldn't it make sense that copper and zinc would also do that for the plant? Now the other interesting thing is that when you get your zinc level up and you have a drought like I'm in right now, the crop can survive and sometimes be very productive. Now I want to talk about a few other things and in order to do that I'm going to uh, get a picture of the root structure of a squash plant. And then we're going to talk about that and we're going to talk about tillage and whatever, but I want to keep this fairly short. <clears throat> this is a wonderful book that was published in 1927 and it covers most of the vegetables that we grow for food consumption. This is in the chapter on winter squash. This happens to be the Golden Hubbard squash, the root pattern at six weeks old. And here is the horizontal pattern. This is this what they did is they dug one foot down and they mapped the spread of the root system of the squash. Now if you consider cultivation and you want to cultivate your squash you run the risk you run a very high risk of interfering with the root system of that squash and that will put it under stress now you've seen the root structure of the squash plant that particular website has the root structure of most of our vegetables 
and that is one of the reasons I do not cultivate. Because if you cultivate below two inches, you are destroying some of the feeder roots of the plant you're cultivating. Now let's go back to the philosophy of what causes insect and disease damage in a plant. Over the years, I have noticed that when a plant is under stress, it can be attacked by disease or insects. It's the same thing for a human body. When you're under stress, you're open to disease and infections. Now, a plant can be under stress because there's no water. It can be under stress because there's a lack of fertility. It can be under stress because something happened to damage the plant. And I just mentioned cultivation. So we need to start thinking like a plant. And we need to treat our plants in a much better form than we have been taught to do or used to do. There's all kinds of philosophies out there. You have people that say, you know, compost is the answer, or wood chips are the answer, or this is the answer, that's the answer. Kenzie and Kenzie Albrecht people are looking at the whole system, and they have come up with balances that are effective in any crop anywhere. So then you have people that say, well, you know, soil tests don't make a difference. You can send a soil sample to one lab and you can send it to another and same sample, you can split it and send it two different directions, three, four different directions. Every lab is going to give you a different result. The reason that that happens is there is no standard for how to run the test or how to report the test. And everybody's in business to make a profit. And so most soil labs run the test as fast, as cheap as they can, and they do the reporting in the fastest and cheapest method. Now there's nothing wrong with that except that unless you know what to do with our numbers, how do you know where you're going? What Kenzie did is he started working, he, Albrecht set it up, he said this is the way the test should be run, this is how it should be run, this is a region that should be used, these are the soak times, the whole, the whole shebang. And Kenzie has used one lab to run all the tests under those specifications, so when he runs the soil test through that lab, he knows exactly what those numbers mean. And because he's worked with numbers that mean something, and he knows what they mean, he's been able to see what works and what doesn't, and, and has had some fantastic results. Does it work just for squash? No. You saw my corn. My reputation at my market garden, I'm not there to outsell anybody. I'm not there to take over and run somebody out of business. Most of my prices are equal to or higher than other people's. I'm not going to undercut anybody. But I have a reputation for the flavor of my squash, for the flavor of my tomatoes, for the flavor of the daikon radishes, the potatoes. A lady walked by my booth Saturday, and, the, and as she passed, I didn't hear the comment, but the booth next to me said, you didn't hear that, but she said to her friend, he has some of the best potatoes. And that's the reputation I have in my market. All I'm trying to do here is help you people understand 
that the soil and the balance of the soil and your cultural practices play a major part in how your crops turn out.